The yeah, first question is, is that it seems to be that you're saying that instead of any kind of intelligent design intervention down the road, that basically there was an intelligent design up front here. The whole thing was pre-programmed from the get-go. That's right. That idea goes back to Charles Babbage, who was the inventor of programmable computers in 1836. He published a paper in which he said exactly that, mm -hmm. that the species we have today weren't necessarily created the way that we have them, but they were pre-programmed in creation and so that they would come out the way it is. And he used his computer as the analogy, and he's the one who actually is based on his work that we have our modern computers. So there is intelligence, and it's ongoing, because as opposed to deism, in deism we have God creates the world, winds it up like a clock, and walks away. Okay, But if these laws of nature are operative today, they don't keep themselves in existence. God has got to keep them in existence. And so God is basically continually operative in keeping the laws of nature and matter in being. And it's really kind of an insult to God to say that he's not smart enough to solve the equations of motion and get the kind of animals he wants 13.75 billion years later, that he's got to be constantly diddling with things. Oh, just did not go quite the way I wanted it. We'll tweak this and add that, and it doesn't need to do it. God is that's a very smart guy. He can solve the equations of motion. Uh, which leads to the second question: uh, solve pre-programmed. Uh, is, is there any room for human free will within that? Yes, because human free will is another intentional process. So we have God's general intentions for nature which give us the general laws of nature. And then we have the fact that God endowed us with free will, which I think we can argue experientially that he did. And free will is in the same genus, the same kind of thing as the divine laws. They're both intentions. And so we have, with regard to our to motions of our own body, the combined intentions of God for the general motion of our parts, but also, in addition, we have our intentions, which can slightly change and perturb those laws. And because the brain is basically a control mechanism, they can take very, very small inputs and magnify them, which every neurologist or neuroscientist agrees with. If we slightly perturb the general laws with our human intentions, then we can free will. And there's been a lot of work studying whether human intentions can modify physical processes and the results are totally staggering because they are 16, 17, 13, depending on the experiment, standard deviations away from being random that we can actually control thermal processes, the way counters run and control quantum processes if we intend to. Can you give some example? This is pretty abstract right here at this point. Examples of what? What do you say? You know, you, you mentioned 13 standards. Okay, well, there's there's something called shot noise. Basically what it is is you, if you take an electronic component like a resistor, because of heat, the components of, of the resistor are moving slightly, okay, in a random way. As a result of that, if you take the output of the resistor and you magnify it with an amplifier, you will get this random kind of noise that you hear when your television is tuned to a station that doesn't exist. That's called shot noise. You can chop it up and you can say, okay, if it's above a certain level, we're going to say we're going to register a 1, and if it's below a certain level, we're going to register a 0, and then you can count how many 1s and how many zeros you get by chopping it up. And then you can tell some poor human person the subject of the psychological experiment Okay, we want more ones than zeros. Please concentrate and try to give us more ones. Here's some concentrates. So 35 out of 10,000 times, you get more ones. Uh, that is to say, you'll get 35 more uh, of the ones that are sought after. And just, just by human and thought, the, the, the effect, physical process. Yes. So the, this work, obviously was greeted with skepticism, and there was a skeptic who basically devoted his professional career to trying to debunk this work, and he said, okay, well, 
you're not doing this and you're not doing that and so on. So he got together with the parapsychologists and they came up with a protocol and they said, if we do this, then you'll believe the answer, right? Yeah. They did this, got the same answer, and he said, I don't believe it. <laughs> what, what, what was the name of the researchers or the part paper? We got on that? It's in my book. So the, these are different independent experiments. I've had you know well over 100 different researchers research this. They've done what's called a meta study, which is basically put all the data together and you get the answer. And so I was talking online to some people about this and they said, oh, meta studies are terrible. Well, who invented meta studies? Physicists invented meta studies. And why did they invent them? Because they wanted better answers for the constants like the speed of light and the charge of the electron and the mass of the electron. So they invented meta studies as a way of combining all the studies that have been made to give us better numbers. So it's not something that, you know, psychologists have pulled out of the blue. They went to the textbook, which happens to be written by a physicist about meta studies, and they followed his methodology. I mean, just be ignorant of an, an easy answer on this, but um, the idea of something being random because it's observed versus being deterministic when it's unobserved, how, how in the world could you ever uh, substantiate a claim about something observed, unobserved? Well, basically, the way the claim is substantiated is the same way that almost all science is substantiated. And that is that we hypothesize the equations of motion. So if you're in the classical regime, we hypothesize Schrodinger's equation. If you're in the relativistic regime, high energies use Dirac's equation, or what's called the klein gordon equation. And you find that these equations give you all the answers that you would want to whatever accuracy you can get. Okay, those equations are deterministic equations. So you can't observe the deterministic outcome, but you can say that on the average, no matter how long the time period, they give you the right answer. And they give you puzzling answers that people find difficult to accept. You know, we have all these paradoxes about quantum physics and locality and so on. All of those come out of the equations. So the equations are extremely well verified, and they're deterministic equations. So why are observations random? Because when we make an observation, we stick our finger in from the outside into the system and perturb it in order to put our finger on the pulse, as it were. Okay? We shine a beam of light at it from the outside to see where it's going to bounce off. Well, we can't determine what that the precise state of that beam of light or our finger is. Because if we were to determine the precise state of the beam of light, we would have to measure it with something else, and then we'd have to measure that with something else, and we'd get, you know, an infinitum, we'd get an unending causal chain. So we can't determine exactly what the initial conditions are in any particular measurement, but as a result of all the measurements, we can say that the deterministic equations work as well as we could ever expect. So if that one experiment, I, I can't remember what's called, is it the double slit? Yeah. So if it's if it's unobserved, then the result would be different than it's... No, I said the, 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 what said uh, when I say observed, I say that because if you read the textbook, let me back up. I want to make a, f a point about evolution, okay? Yeah. So therefore I want to have something that everybody agrees to. I don't want anything controversial, which my own interpretation would be considered controversial. Okay. So everyone agrees in textbooks the unobserved physical processes are determinist. That's a textbook statement. Yeah. Okay, so therefore, there's no randomness before the advent of intelligent observers, whether they be alpha centurions or humans or whatever they are. Now, what happens when humans observe things? I believe that it's not intelligent intervention that causes the problem. It's interaction with bulk matter. And no matter what kind of observation we make, we always are interacting with bulk matter. And so bulk matter has different physics than individual particles taken in abstraction. And I can show you the equations. But anyway, because it has different physics, processes are going to act differently when interacting with detectors. But we can't predict what it is because we don't know the prior state of the detector. So it's in the two-slit experiment, we get individual dots because the photons or the electrons, whatever we're using, uh, are interacting with individual atoms. And just as when you look at the Tunguska event, remember in uh, Siberia in the early 1900s, there was this event that knocked down thousands of trees over hundreds of miles. Okay, the individual trees are all knocked down. They're all individuals. 
Does that mean that the wave that knocked them down was a particle? No. It just means that the things that it interacted with, the trees, were individuals. And so when we interact with some sort of detector, whether it's film or, or whatever it is, it's made of individual atoms. And so we're going to get individual limits. But I don't put that in my argument because yeah, I don't want to get sidetracked. Yeah, yeah. like I just said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's all right for having a discussion. You mentioned three Christian responses, creationism, intelligent design, and theistic evolution. Yeah. And would there be most of the quarrel confined to creationism, some of it in intelligent design, and the theistic evolution Christians? Or there's no well, there's there. more Catholics than there are fundamentalists, so most Catholics are theistic evolutionists, and most Baptists are creationists, and a lot of other people, evangelicals, are kind of in the intelligent design thing. So I would say probably more people believe in theistic evolution, but maybe more Protestants believe in creationism and I mean, theistic evolutionists, I'm sorry, can get along fine with whatever evolutionists or scientific right. evolutionists. You know? So we don't get an argument sort of scientists who say, okay, we agree about this. Yeah. We just disagree We just disagree about how you're interpreting it. And when you read Dawkins' book, or books, he's got a lot of them, from that approach, you find that he's got horrible logic about, you know, his interpretations. You know, he... He writes a computer program to demonstrate that there's no mind in evolution, and he puts the target that he wants right into his program, and then he says, oh, it's a random process. Well, come on. And he won't argue with Craig, by the way. Uh, it's been a while since I read some of Biologos stuff, but is this synonymous with their views? With whose views? Biologos. 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 I don't know the, that term, so okay. that's a new term. Uh, okay, it's, it's basically something... Uh, Francis Collins, okay, uh, the guy, the genome guy, so yeah. forth. Uh, he, he basically developed a organization called BioLogos, which uh, is fairly strong on the idea of theistic evolution. Okay. okay. Um, well, I might very well agree with him, but I haven't read well, his stuff, so I wouldn't say without reading. But anyway, all I'm saying here is that if we just take the science the way it's being offered to us, and we carefully remove all of these atheistic interpretations, which are just basically hijacking the science, the science doesn't support the conclusions that atheists and naturalists would have us believe. It just doesn't. Or it can't. Well, it can't and it doesn't. I mean, you can take it apart. It does not do it. I mean, it's not random. You know, the laws, you can make a very good case are intentional. You want to see my argument? Okay, logical propagators. Normally, all premises must be true at the same time as the conclusion. So... All now in the room can hear me. John will be in the room tomorrow. John can hear me. Obviously, invalid. Why? Because the two premises are true at different times. So, in normal logic, we need to have all the premises being true at the same time. In order to get around this, we need what I call logical propagators, is my own term. They allow premises true at one time to imply conclusions true at another time. All in the room when I speak can hear me. I now intend to speak in the room tomorrow. John will be in the room tomorrow. This is reasonable, rational, and so what allows it to go is my intention. It carries from time now to time in the future, and it allows the conclusion to be valid, and so John can hear me tomorrow. Well, there are only two types. There's committed human intentions, which allow us to predict the future to a degree, and there are the laws of nature, which allow us to predict the future to a degree. Other than that, nothing else is a logical propagator. So these are two species and a single genus, two subtypes of one genus. The genus of logical propagators has got the two species of human, intent, human committed intentions and laws of nature. And so logical propagators belong to the logical order, was their basis in the real order, the dispositions to act and guide the time development of physical systems. So both of these, my intention guides the time development of my body, and the laws of nature guide the time development of nature. And so I committed human intentions and the laws of nature are two species of the same genus. They share a common dynamics, but intentions derive from human minds. The laws of nature are maintained by God. And by analogy, the laws of nature are God's general intentions for man. So they're the only two things that are logical propagators, nothing else. They're not intentions, if intention means human intention, but they're work-like intentions, and who maintains them in being 
is God, so there are things which act like God's intentions. You can call them divine intentions if you want to, that's if I can't. Yes. Okay, so a little bit, I think, like, let's say we had a, a handful of each of those groups we mentioned before, you know, sort of fundamentalists, creationists, the other two groups. Um, I mean, it would, bound to become, it would be bound to come up, um, like, how far can we stretch the exegesis in Genesis? Uh, does there come a point at which you look at it and you say, this works for me, but I do feel like I'm stretching the text? Well, the question is, what's your theory of inspiration? I'm Catholic. Our theory of inspiration is that God inspires people, and then they put what their the intelligence, let's call it, the information, the resonance, whatever it is, they put what they're inspired with in their own human terms. So if I was inspired today to say that God created all reality, everything that existed, I would state it in terms of physics and evolution and biology and all the things that we know today. But if somebody in Babylonian exile, uh, which was when Genesis was put together as a single text, when somebody in the Babylonian exile were to do that, he would say, what? What are you talking about? I mean, it would be total nonsense. Nobody would understand anything. And so you have to say, what is the intention of the author of Genesis? Well, the intention, it seems to me, is to say that all reality is utterly dependent on God, not self-explaining. If you compare it to the other creation myths of the times, there were wars between feuding gods that, you know, one killed the other and their body became, uh, I mean, all this nonsense. And so basically the author of Genesis says, no, 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 none of that. It was by the divine word. God said, let there be light. And because of his word, because of its intention, its effective intention, there's light. And so it seems to me that the points are that the world is utterly dependent on God, that human beings screwed it up, which we certainly did, and are continuing to do. There are other points too, but th those are fundamental points that the author was trying to convey. But there's two creation accounts in Genesis, and if you lay them side by side, their order is different. So obviously the order of creation is not what the author is intending to convey, it's, it's the fact of creation and the fact of our dependence and God's, you know, complete supremacy. Yeah, I see that. And some, if you take it general enough, some of the general points, they, they definitely coincide even between those different views. Right. And so... Um, but something like fixed species on the plainest read of the text is the first thing you get out of it, and then you sort of have to get past that. Well, to get to these other but do you get that out of the text, or do you bring it to the text? Well, yeah, you know, on a surface read, I'm saying, like, if you had been through, you know, looking at different views, and you're just a, a casual person, and you look at it, you're not going to get theistic evolution. No, you're not going to get theistic evolution because it's a scientific that's just, that's just the tension I'm playing with. All right, yeah. Well, at what point, I, yeah. point is it stretched too far? Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, you know, basically, I looked at my own tradition, which is Catholic. Probably 95% of the fathers were very liberal-minded about Genesis. Augustine wasn't. Later, Aquinas wasn't. You know, the, the real luminaries, they were a little bit. Yeah. But, you know, the average father was very literal about Genesis. And it wasn't until the 1870s, 80s, 90s, the Catholic theology, looking at the advance, not of biology, but of geology, where, you know, you could see how long it took to cut the Grand Canyon or whatever, that they said, well, you know, maybe 4,000 years is not long enough. Um, and so they said, well, you know, we need to rethink our interpretation of Genesis. How we so the last follow-up on that would be, what would this confirm for you presently scale on you? Like, what sort of, what would it, I guess, what would it take to disconfirm what you're Well, saying? I mean, basically it would be whatever disconfirms evolution or, you know, cosmology or whatever it happens to be that's a subcomponent of my, you know, the scientific foundation. So if, it, if somebody can disprove evolution, I, I don't think somebody's going to disprove evolution, but, you know, this business of punctuated equilibrium, that certainly was not what Darwin was talking about. You know, he's got this gradualism and doesn't believe in catastrophic events and asteroids hitting the earth and that sort of thing. It just never occurred to him that that would be the case. So evolution is going to probably... Uh, in, in effect, though, you are throwing away the thing as soon as you throw away the randomness piece. Yeah. 
right. So, in effect, you know, what you're talking about here is not the same thing that a secularist is talking well, about. Well, but you see, a secular things. biologist doesn't know what he's talking about if he hasn't studied his physics. Because I started this as a physicist. I was reading this, Aquinas' design argument doesn't work because we have this random process. Well, we don't have this random process. At least we didn't have it before humans evolved. And so... I think you can approach it on a purely secular point of view. You know, it may be acceptable in biological circles, but if you go across the lines of the physics building, you'll find that it's not acceptable. So it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily do anything to this view one way or another. But how does, based on the system of understanding, what would you do with miracles as far as interventions? In uh, I think that God has a different purpose in miracles. You know, God basically wants. Oh, well, take the resurrection. You know, the primary. Right? I mean, the resurrection makes a very specific point that death is not the end. And the things which, to the human mind, seem to be defeat are theologically and spiritual people are not defeats at all. When I was, I lived in Delaware a while, and we had a Jewish priest, Father Gershom Goldstein. And Father Gershom Goldstein was English, and he was a cantor, and he went to Lourdes with the sole purpose of debunking. He spent two years there, and he looked at the records, and he looked at the records, and he looked at the records, and he finally decided that it didn't agree with his theology, but it was true. So I accept his word for it. I mean, you know, this was the person who had everything to lose, and he lost his family. I mean, he was thrown out of his family. You know, everything that would be the normal human motivations for not accepting this, he had, and still felt a good conscience that he couldn't do that. To get specific on this, but Jesus really rise from the dead in a literal body? Uh, this is literally his human eye? Or well, I think, you know, I think his body was uh, what the Bible calls a glorified body. I mean, you know, it could pass through a locked door, so it wasn't exactly it, it what It wasn't exactly, but it was fair enough, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 I, I believe in the resurrection, yeah. Okay. I, you know, and why do I believe in the resurrection? Because... 11 out of 12 apostles got killed rather than saying, oh, no, I was just lying. I made it all up. No, no crucifying me upside down. Okay. Right, right. So I don't think that it's rational that they would have done that. But something like the, the one, that last example about the risk, and the, 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 the pre-risk or the pleasure, yeah. um, I mean, that's not by, it's not natural selection because it's pre- it's like pre natural selection. It's pre programmed. So, so it means that natural selection doesn't have all the mechanisms needed. It does, natural selection doesn't. Here, I'll read you the. So that's uh, part of the software. Well, I mean, it can be pre programmed without being natural selection. And without being, what I'm saying is without being supernatural. But yeah. Like, okay, read. In 2006, Neil Shupin reported the discovery of Talic roseate. Uh, a 375 million year old fossil uh, land exploring fish on Canada's Elsmere Island. So he said, This was telling us that a piece of the toolkit to make arms, legs, hands, feet could very well be present in fish limbs. Lacking were the environmental conditions where these structures would be useful. So there's no natural selection pressure to yeah. do this. It doesn't mean that there's no precursors in the sense that it's irreducibly complex, but the toolkits to create all these things were present before they were needed. I just went to a lecture this morning, and the guy was pointing out that the eye has come up independently. He mentioned three examples, though I understand it's about 50, but they all use the same underlying control structure. Right. Okay. That's like part of computer too. programming, you're writing a code, and you're pulling something from a subroutine library. Right. Well, there's there are these toolkit genes, and there are many of them. One's for the beak, let's say. So the beak, we have parrot beaks that are really powerful, and they make their breaking nuts. And we have hummingbird beaks that are long and thin, and not at all powerful, but they're good for getting down inside flowers. All of them are basically expressions of the single toolkit gene. And what causes them to be expressed differently are these homeobox genes, which are basically the knobs that you twiddle. And so the same thing here, we have this toolkit to develop arms and legs and so on, but it wasn't necessary to do it. So that means that the way in which carbon and hydrogen and the amino acids which go to make up DNA, the way they're programmed 
physically, chemically, they construct these things before they are needed to develop hands and legs and fingers and toes. Any other questions not from these two chairs? <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's break apart and thank Dennis again. And uh, you can ask more questions.